Some people say there are no problems, only challenges. It's very annoying, we've all heard it, but there is some truth to it. And that truth is what we tried to uh, convey in the, uh, formulating the program of this conference. We started out with the questions about how to meet the challenges of today, how, to, how the climate crisis is really a democratic challenge. And today, in this concluding session, we're going to take it one step further because we're not going to say that there are no problems, only challenges, but we see that the challenges we face offers a lot of possibilities. And that's what we want to uh, try to uh, get our thoughts into in this, this last sec session because we have organized this conference on the assumption that scholars and activists can learn from each other. And we've tried to create a program which uh, highlights both the very practical and the more theoretical issues, the analysis together with uh, what people are doing in their own communities. And <coughs> I'm very happy that we have uh, uh, this panel. We will have Dan Chalukov from uh, Vermont, Johanna, who has been working with uh, international campaigns on water rights. We have Mark Lucarelli, the author of Green, uh, of Mark, Lewis Mumford and the Ecological Region and editor of Green Oslo. And we have Javin, who is a journalist uh, from Kurdistan. So, we we'll open this with a 10-minute presentation by each of these speakers, and then we have open for comments and questions, and then we let them sum it up in the end. So, welcome, Dan Chodokov. Thank you. Thank you, Eric. Um, I was asked to speak for 10 minutes about a new social movement that I thought was of great importance, and I find that an impossible task. But I'll try, and to confound the task even more, I'm going to talk about three movements, not one. Uh, the first two movements I want to talk about are broadly grouped under the rubric of climate justice. The first is a group called Occupy Sandy, which was an outgrowth of the Occupy Wall Street movement. Occupy Sandy responded to Superstorm Storm Sandy's destruction in the far Rockaway neighborhood of New York, a very poor, low-income neighborhood located on the seacoast, which was devastated by the storm. And the Occupy activists were actually the first people to enter that neighborhood uh, to provide relief to the citizens. They got there before the Red Cross, they got there before FEMA, they got there before any of the official agencies. And what's significant about what they did is they not only delivered relief, but they looked around and they decided to stay, to establish a permanent presence in the neighborhood, to form alliances with local groups, working on issues ranging from planning and development, trying to stop the foreclosure of options for them in the future by speculators who were ready to gobble up the valuable waterfront property and build high-income apartment houses. Uh, they created a co-op which is forming other co-ops now to provide some economic development in the community. And they created a, a coalition of groups called Rockaway Wildfire. They have a website you can go on for more information. But I just want to raise them as an example of the way in which our movement needs to embed itself in real communities and for the long haul. We have to make commitments to work with people where they live and to develop alternatives with them in a democratic fashion. This is a good example of that very briefly. Second movement I want to talk to you about is something that I'm involved in in my community in Vermont, where I serve on our town energy and climate change committee. And there are co energy and climate change committees in most of the towns in Vermont today. Some of them are official organs of the town government, as ours is. And our town government, by the way, is a participatory direct democracy town meeting form of government. Uh, others are unofficial. But we've undertaken projects working to educate our town about issues of climate change. We've brought public transportation to our town in the form of bus service for the first time ever. We've gone into low-income families' homes, mostly drafty old farmhouses and small trailers, helped them identify ways that they can tighten up their homes and save energy. We've created a tax mechanism to help people fund 
energy improvements and solar installations for their homes. We've converted all of our town buildings to much more energy efficient standards. We've erected uh, solar photovoltaic panels providing electricity for all of our town buildings. We're in the process of working with our local school to get them on a solar photovoltaic system. We've encouraged locals in the town to build their own systems and we're in the process of establishing an energy cooperative in the town as well. Small steps, very local, but taken over the scope of the whole state, they amount to something. And Vermont as a state is in the process of transforming to 100% renewable energy by the year 2050. That's the official goal of the state and the local energy committees are one of the main mechanisms we're going to use to get, get there. Okay. The third movement that I want to talk to you about, which I think is in many ways the most significant movement, is the one that we are all a part of here today. Uh, Margaret Mead said, never doubt for a moment the ability of a small, thoughtful, committed group of citizens to change the world. In fact, that's the only thing that ever has. And I feel that we are a part of that process. If we look at how change has occurred historically, I would point to the example of the Enlightenment. And not so much the content of the Enlightenment, but to understand the process of how a society transforms itself, both in terms of the tropes that it uses, the, the kinds of sensibility that it develops, and very importantly, the underlying structures of the society. The Enlightenment was the result of a small group of very radical thinkers who put all of these crazy ideas out into the air that the king did not rule by divine right, that people had the capacity to democratically govern themselves, that the economy should not be controlled by a manorial system, that the church didn't have the answer to everything. These were incredibly radical ideas. And they flew in the face of the reality of the time in which these thinkers lived. And initially, it was a tiny group of people. They didn't have the levels of literacy that we have today. They didn't have the technology of the computer and the internet, high-speed printing presses. They had printing presses. Very few people could read. But these ideas were published. They were passed from hand to hand. They percolated. They were discussed in taverns and over dinner tables. They percolated for about 100 years. And then ultimately, they gave rise to the so-called democratic revolutions, the American Revolution, the French Revolution, which utterly transformed the underlying structures of those societies. I feel we're in the midst of such a process today, that we all have a role to play in that, that perhaps these ideas began with a small group, but we're not such a small group anymore. We've seen this weekend that there are people around the world who embrace these ideas and work with them actively in a transformative way. We need to carry that process forward. We need to underst understand ourselves as the change, as embodying the change which has to come into being. We need to create our organizations and our projects in a way which prefigures the new society that we need to achieve. We need to work on many different levels. We need to protest, certainly. We have to stop the destruction which is going on today. We also need to create alternatives. We need to demonstrate to the world that these ideas are not crazy, that in fact they're very practical, that they can work, and that people can not only make decisions through representative democratic structures, but through directly democratic structures. So we need to work on the political level as well. And when we can begin to pull these three forms of action together, and obviously different people have different skills, different levels of comfort, there are many points of entry into this process, but we all have to participate actively. And when we can do that, I believe we can change the world. We can create an ecological society. We can reharmonize people in nature. And I must be approaching the 10 minute mark. Yes, okay. So I will close with a quote, one of my favorite quotes. Uh, during the French student uprising in 1968, the students of Nanterre wrote on the university walls, be realistic, do the impossible. <laughs> and Murray Bookchin added to that, if we don't do the impossible, we face the unthinkable. So I'll leave you with that. Thank you. Thank you, Dan. Johanna? Yeah. 
Yes, so my name is Joanna Rivera and I'm originally from Puerto Rico, but many, many uh, rounds have taken me to, to Iraq, uh, a Puerto Rican in Iraq who met an origin and ended up here in Oslo. So that's uh, why I'm here and now I have a little baby, so I, uh, yeah, I'm, I'm planning to stay here for a little bit and not go back to Iraq. Uh, at least for <laughs> the time being. But yet, talking about the impossible and the unthinkable, uh, I mean, building an ecological movement in, in Iraq, uh, and I spoke about it yesterday, how ecological movements uh, are um, emerging in, in the Middle East. Uh, and I spoke about the case of the Iraqi marshes and how uh, we work on the protection of the Iraqi marshes in an environmental campaign. Uh, but I couldn't talk about this without talking about uh, solidarity. So my theme uh, is uh, about solidarity. In our campaign, we focus on the protection of the Iraqi marshes uh, from development projects like Ili Sudam. Uh, Ili Sudam is going to destroy uh, culture, environment, and history in Turkey as well as, as in Iraq. Uh, the dam will destroy um, thousands of years of history in, in Turkey and will flood uh, th uh, those archaeological sites, which uh, some of them have been even not uh, studied yet. Uh, yeah, thousands of years of civilization, both in Turkey and in Iraq. The Iraqi marshes are uh, the garden, some say the Garden of Eden, the land of the Sumerians where agriculture started. Uh, so yeah, it has important cultural uh, and her, uh, cultural uh, uh, and environmental um, value. Uh, that's why we have joined with Turkish and uh, Kurdish activists, and, and Havin is here. I, I was glad to meet her uh, and have something in common uh, because I thought, you know, water issues have, haven't been discussed in, in this uh, conference, so I wanted to bring that, that that's what I bring uh, to this conference. Uh, we have joined with uh, Turkish and Kurdish activists in. Uh, solidarity because we have a common fight. We, we want to fight against daily Sudan. They are fighting in a political level. We are also fighting in a political and environmental uh, level. The <coughs> dam is not only a challenge to ecology, but it's also a democratic challenge. Uh, it has been built without the consultation to the local communities in Turkey and <coughs> let alone in, in Iraq. There's no uh, environmental transboundary um, impact assessment. So we don't know exactly the extent of the damage, but we know it's going to affect millions of people, both in Turkey and, and in Iraq. Uh, Turkey is trying to consolidate power, and, and it's trying to consolidate a regional power by, by using mining and also uh, dams and, and mining projects. And in doing so, it will appropriate water resources that are shared between not only Turkey, but also Syria, Iraq, and, and Iran. Uh, in building movements, new movements, the role of solidarity is key as it strengthens local communities and empower communities when they feel they are, they are alone. For example, in, in Turkey, if you speak about Ili Sudam, you're, uh, you're labeled a terrorist. So in that sense, you know, going there, we were there uh, with Iraqi activists, with international activists protesting uh, in, the, that is in the side of the dam uh, construction. Uh, because Turkey considers uh, the dam a uh, national security issue, so whoever talks ab about the dam, it's talking against uh, the establishment of, of the state. So, uh, in how this all this plays in Iraq, in Iraq, uh, new democratic and civil platforms are developing now that are also building the principle of global solidarity. It's uh, exactly one year today that I was in Baghdad in the first uh, Iraqi social forum. Uh, which is building the platform of the World Social Forum. Um, and we were there with a delegation of international activists and working together with Iraqi activists. Uh, I was working only on the issue of, of water, but there are trade unionists, uh, freedom of expression issues, uh, women's issues, and there were different uh, international activists that are working together with Iraqi activists in, in solidarity. Uh, the Iraqi Social Forum was the first regional uh, forum, and it's very important because it, it brings uh, solidarity and it brings you know, Iraq into the global network of 
of the different movements. Environmental movements is only in one of them. So where I see hope, it's in the global solidarity and the connection between North and South activists that are uh, building this ecological movement. So it, it gives uh, Iraqis the, the comfort that they are part of a bigger movement, that they, they're not alone, that they're fighting, for example, they, they were in Tunis and they met uh, activists from Peru, from India, from Mexico that have been working on dam issues for 20 years. And, they, and, and, and our campaign only started two years ago. So they feel, you know, it's, we're not going to achieve anything. But when they met the, the activists in, you know, in, in Tunis from India that have been working uh, for 20 years, it gives them hope. And when they go and do advocacy meetings with the Iraqi government, they, they, they can stand on their feet and say, we're, we know what we're talking about. We don't want that dam. That dam is going to appropriate our water resources. And you as a government are responsible to do something about it. So yeah, that's what I wanted to share with you. And I think, yeah, global solidarity. We're, we're here in a democratic forum. We can discuss these ideas. But it's very difficult in a new demo emerging democracy as Iraq. And now the water issue is very, very hot with the, all the war that is going on in, in Iraq the Mosul Dam and all the water resources are being taken by other actors. And I, I think our campaign will, uh, will go into that direction now, not only talking about Ili Sudan, but talking about water resources as a whole. So yeah, there's a lot of challenges, but I see that there is hope and there are possibilities with a North and South cooperation uh, that Iraqis uh, benefit from the global exchange of ideas and yeah. I think, yeah. Thank you. Thank you very much, Johanna. Uh, now uh, we will have Mark. So, Mark Lucarelli. I'm not sure I got put on the right panel because I'm not really an activist, I must say. And I'm not an optimist either, so. <laughs> <clears throat> but I'd like to, um, I, I was involved in the Green Oslo Project, as you heard. And I'd like to try my hand at, I do environmental studies, uh, various kinds. I'd like to try my hand at explaining what I think is going on. I think. Our concerns, as I've, I've been at the conference since this morning, so I haven't been here the whole time, but what I've been hearing are three major things. Concern about the civil sphere, about movement politics, and finally about systematic or systemic social and environmental change. And specifically, how do you go from the first level to the, to the general level? And I want to address that just by making three points. First of all, why uh, we can talk about ecology and an environment and why that's still important. Secondly, where can environmental concerns be applied? And third, how can those concerns be institutionalized and made systematic? So contrary, again, to maybe the theme of the conference, I have to say that I think that uh, we're here and we discuss ecology. There's an environmental movement that's been going on for some time uh, because it's a problem. And uh, recently, I've been uh, in the process of preparing the introduction to another book and <clears throat> looked up John Dewey's The Public and Its Problems, which has always been a source for me. And he said that civil society is always defined by negativities that raise awareness about issues and that uh, galvanize the public. But the problem always is that the public can be fragmented. How can the public hold together? I'll come to that. But so I think first, my first point is, is that uh, the problematic of, eco of, the, of the ecological crisis, of, an, of, an, of environmental degradation and so forth is very important to hold on to as a touchstone. Uh, secondly, let's see, where can environmental concerns be applied? Well, 
they weren't applied in the Green Oslo project. They're not really applied very much in green urbanism. And in my view, um, there are obstacles in the way to applying that <coughs> um, those concerns um, in any kind of political way in the structure of the institutions that we're living under. Those structures vary from, from nation to nation, society to society a bit. So I'm only going to be speaking about my experience in Norway. I wanted to use Green Oslo as a way to in, in, engage a debate in what you're talking about, academics and people in the civil society. But it was impossible to do that for reasons of our uh, standing in the academic community, um, which I think is an, an, an interesting point. So I think that rather, and we had a discussion in one of the groups that was very interesting about, for example, what is, an, what is urban? What is an urban prop? What is an urban problem? What is an environmental problem and so forth? What is environment? Where is that? So I came up with a phrase in response to that which is I think we should move from in thinking about environmental or ecological spaces in the city or out in the country as it was done before to thinking about spaces of contestation where environment and ecology can come into play. Um, so one such space is the university. And I can tell you right now, in my years of being here, most of what I do, workaholic, uh, and sit there in my office, um, it is impossible to address an issue of environmental studies inside the, inside the structure of the university today. It is very, very difficult, if not impossible. You can do it in individual courses. To create a program <laughs> is impossible because of the bureaucratization of the university, because of the structures, because of the emphasis on research, because of the de-emphasis on teaching. There's a thousand things. And that's very important because the university is a big zero right now. It is not producing ideas of social change. We are sitting with ideas that we've inherited from 40 or 50 years ago. That's it. And we're not producing new ideas because of a set of structures. You know who has the power to do, change that? You do if you're a student. One week of demonstrations, and I guarantee you this administration would crumble. And we could get the programs. We could get the emphasis on teaching. We could then, you know. So that's what I mean. What are other places of contestation? It's good. It's good. Yeah. Five minutes. <clears throat> Uh, well, I mean, so I don't, I'm not completely won over to radicalism. That was my youth. You know, I won't go into that, some of the things I said. Uh, but, for example, you could, we, could, uh, re we could reach, I'm involved in this peripherally, although Oslo is not in the Arctic region, but Norway is. Wouldn't it be nice to get an agreement among the Arctic nations to demilitarize and protect the Arctic and control development of it. That's a space uh, which is working with the established institutions. You have to convince nations, in that case, that it's in their interest to cooperate rather than to do what's going to happen in the world, what's increasingly happened. Globalization is a paper-thin wallpaper over the conflicts that are emerging in the world. I won't go into why I think that's happening, but you probably get some idea. So that's a, that would be a, a useful project that's more traditional, not aimed at a, a social movement so much, but as using the, the university and journalism and so forth to uh, marshal forces toward uh, making an agreement on a regional level among nations. So that's another example. There's a, I just read, the global parliament of mayors may happen. So there's the idea of municipal, municipalities joining together. And within the context of a global 
conference, annual conference of mayors from over 600 cities all across the world, that could be a, a space where environmental issues are brought up and, and contested. But I think, in, in effect, there are two criteria that have to be answered to make these spaces and areas of contestation valuable. One is that either it is a political space that is linked to a social movement that contests for power, because you're always working against the capacity to take over green urbanism, right? Or to take over regionalism before. I studied Lewis Mumford. He had great, I knew all this. Back in the 1920s, there were, people were talking in our group about connecting the city to the country. All the planning was there. And, and, and after the war, it was just appropriated by development interests that gave us our regions in their image. And then they could call and call it a region, so much so that Jane Jacobs was confused about what Lewis Mumford had actually said back in the 1920s, but that's another question. So appropriate, when you have any kind of a discourse that's out there in this media sphere of today, it just is, can be appropriated and turned completely around. Read Dolores Hayden's book on Brooklyn. It's fantastic. Everything that was about Brooklyn that seemed radical, working class, gritty, and so forth, had just been turned around into a real estate scheme. She's, she's got it. She's hit it right on, on the head. The second thing is that you can shape regional environmental spaces if you can make an appeal to the self-interest of states that are involved. Very difficult because, as I said, states are competitors and, and the competition is heating up. But last thing, I, I only have two minutes, I really want it more. Have you ever heard of Galton? I just got this from an article in Foreign Affairs by a political scientist at Gothenburg's university. Green alternative liberal, Gao, Tan, versus traditional authoritarian nationalists. That's why national poli I, I'm not giving up on the nation state, national politics. The reason why we can't move forward in national politics is that our values are contested by people who don't quite share them and don't see why they should, because it seems to be a sphere of people with a lot of money or a lot of education, whereas most people don't have that. And they don't, <clears throat> and, uh, and we're not contesting economic issues. So, uh, earlier talk today, I talked about values, this is my last comment, of reconstruction, resurrection of hope, um, rebuilding our societies and so forth. So the, to actually make a transformation on a systemic level, you have to actually come up with a politics that links environmental concerns, urban concerns, with economic ones. That is, global warming is a useful thing. The solution to global warming is rebuilding all kinds of infrastructures. The, the solution to global warming will require the employment of millions of people. That means that you can, you don't no longer have to go in there and tell people give up something. No, you, this is a program for jobs. It's a program for regional redevelopment. It's a program for the development of cities that are outside of the global network we have today. And if, if such, a, such a reorientation of national politics could occur in separate countries, you know, maybe linked and so forth, then you could have the kind of systematic uh, transformation that the world really needs. Thank you. Thank you, Mark. Then the last speaker on this panel is Havin. Havin Gunasir from Kurdistan. Hi, I want to also thank the organizers for such a conference because I think it's now the second of its kind. In 2012, uh, for the first time, the Kurdish Freedom Movement had a conference in Hamburg where it wanted to present um, its own outlook for the future. And that's where 
we tried to open up a little bit more what we understood of democratic confederalism and how the movement had actually was influenced by Mari Bookchin's um, works. But before getting into all that, I have to say that I wanted to be a magician while I was a kid. <laughs> and it, it, it's important again to mention that, uh, not because of the profound reasons. Uh, when in the 1970s I lived in a Turkey where all identities and rights were repressed and there was a terrible situation of the left and the right wing fighting one another and the left fighting amongst each other. But today the, the reason is different. I have 10 minutes and I see that I have a mixed audience where some uh, don't really know what the Kurdish question is about, the politics that involves it in the Middle East, its complexities, the transformation that the Kurdish Freedom Movement PKK and as its leader Öcalan has gone through over the 40 years. And of course the present situation and its aspirations for the future. So it's going to be very difficult. Um, but let me begin by giving a glimpse of the past. And that is that the PKK began as a group in 1973. Uh, by a very small student group. And it's important to know that this small group did not only have Kurdish people in it. It had people from Black Sea region, who are usually Pontus and other peoples in the region. And it had two women. And also it, has, it had the Kurdish people and it, they all had different beliefs in terms of their background, uh, religious backgrounds. So, and it came at a time when, you know, the new left, the 1968 World Revolution was really high. And of course, the old left was very strong in the Middle East at the time. So the PKK formed during these times. So it had in itself the old and the new aspirations. And I have to also tell you that it was born at such a time that in Turkey, Kurds were declared non-existent. Turkish people were made to believe that Anatolia, Mesopotamia, everywhere was empty as they came into Turkey. So Kurds were mountain Turks. They did not exist. So imagine this. And on top of it, of course, PKK was born as a Marxist-Leninist organization. So at a time, too, Middle East was highly, um, you know, there were lots of political games going on so that people would not become left-wing. Instead, you know, uh, they would be some other leniences. And of course, uh, th the situation was not so different in the other parts. Arabs called the Kurds um, Yemeni Arabs. And Persians called the Kurds, you know, sub-ethnic, you know, like um, relatives of the Persians. So they were all, in fact, in all parts, uh, denied their identity. Of course, um, the approach of the real, so real socialism at the time was also not very, not positive at all. Because of the Yalta agreement between the US and the Soviet Union, the Kurdish movements did not actually get uh, any support from the real socialist countries either. At the best, they were ignored. At the worst, there was a huge anti-propaganda. So I remember, for example, uh, the PKK being called a peasants movement, you know, seen as very backward and seen that they can't be Marxist, Leninist at the time. So this is the setting, <laughs> actually, uh, that the PKK was born into. So although it had some elements, which I will talk about, which allowed for it to um, give a self-critique and adopt democratic confederalism was due to those streaks that it carried with it throughout these 40 years. So as I said, until 1993, because between 93 and 2014, we can call it a transformation period. It was Marxist-Leninist, 
It adopted the strategy of people's protracted warfare. It had the objective of united, independent, and socialist Kurdistan. But in time, PKK came across some serious problems that real socialism faced, national liberation movements faced, social democracy, we know where it ended. And it, from 90, between 93 and 2004, one could say, um, it tried to understand what were the critical points. And it came up, I mean, there are many aspects, you know, from education, universities, for example, um, to aesthetics, to, you know, you name it, multi-dimensional issues that need to be discussed, but the crunch of the matter, the PKK saw that it was the relationship with the state of these movements, it was the woman's question, how it approached it, and it was the way it approached revolutionary violence. These were the very three important um, things that, that it determined. So, um, in actually 2004, I'd like to mention, but uh, I know Janet and um, others maybe can fill in the gaps later, but in 2004, lawyers of Ajalan uh, tried to contact Mari Bookchin uh, in the hope that Ajalan from his prison cell could get in touch with him and discuss a little bit more about the problems associated uh, in implementing uh, these. And in 2006, when Mari Bookchin passed away, uh, PKK Assembly actually declared that they will be uh, you know, implementing democratic confederalism in Kurdistan, and they will make sure that this happens. So I think, if I'm not wrong, someone can correct me, but it's the very first time that at a large scale there is an attempt, and I say an attempt because there are multiple problems associated with this, to implement democratic confederalism in the Middle East. Now, Öcalan has defined his system, and the PKK has also adopted this, that if capitalist modernity, and he, he does not hand over modernity to capitalism. He says modernity has a capitalist and a democratic aspect to it. And he calls democratic modernity the lives and struggles of all of us for the past 5,000 years. And he, he establishes three pillars as opposed to capitalist modernity. So instead of capitalism, he, he proposes social economy based on use value. Instead of nation state, he proposes democratic nation. And instead of industrialism, he proposes ecologic industry. And of course, hand in hand with this, how we look at revolutionary violence is very important. He has gone from the point of revolutionary violence to legitimate self-defense. Because what he is saying is that state can never be democratic. Democracy and state are two separate things. Therefore, what we need to do is render state ineffective <laughs> and create other tools. Because just like Bookchin, he's gone throughout the whole 5,000 year old history and he's come to the conclusion that if all these struggles did not achieve what they set out to achieve, and that's basically the freedom, no? and stop exploitation and this and that, is due to the fact that we are using the same tools as patriarchy, and capitalism is the latest uh, stage of that. So the, um, violence has also been monopolized by state. So we are, in fact, at the hands of state in terms of our self-defense protection, because any time armies and police can turn against us. And we see this may be the most in the Middle East, as Kurds maybe more often, but in Europe and elsewhere too, in Turkey too, when people rise against the system, they also see the limits of the boundaries of the state and that it is not really that democratic. 
So self-defense issue is very important. And in fact, he is looking at a dual system where you have representative democracy. And for that, he calls Repub a Republic of Turkey to be democratized. So democratic republic for Turkey, for Iran, Syria, and Iraq, but in relation to that, democratic autonomy, not based on ethnicity or region, but on what we've been talking about. I mean, the fact is he's saying, unfortunately, I haven't found any other new terminology, because when people hear of democratic autonomy, they automatically think of the autonomies that have been you know, so far around, but it is not. So, um, and he insists that not only in general society, but especially women too need to have self-defense forces. Because, I mean, maybe we, we really do need to talk about um, women's revolution as well, because it is at the crunch of the matter. And let me say why it is so. Um, we can see that with indigenous people as well. When an invading force or a force that wants to change the already existing system in one place goes and occupies, the only way to make sure it's institutionalized is to get rid of what's there before. So therefore, um, this is also a very important issue. Um, I know I haven't got any time left, <laughs> but as I said, I should have been a magician maybe. <laughs> it may have worked, but um, at the moment, there is a huge attack. I mean, I didn't talk about the present at all. Maybe it will come with the question, questions. But at the moment, it looks as if ISIS, with all its might, is attacking the Kurdish region, and especially of Kobani in the Syrian Kurdistan. Now, suddenly, Syrian Kurdistan stepped ahead with the implementation of democratic confederalism because the opportunity rose with the the chaotic situation that is in the Middle East at the moment. So the Kurds grabbed this opportunity not to declare an independent state, but to exactly do what they've been saying, to form or to try and you know, implement this democratic confederalism and to democratize Syria. So, but now there's a huge attack on this, and despite the news, Nobody is doing anything about it. It's only the Kurds who are fighting off this ISIS. It serves Turkey. It serves everybody. That democratic confederalism idea does not survive there. So um, I actually would like to maybe later uh, ask that there is a protest in front of the Oslo parliament. Maybe later we can discuss it, go and visit them. But as I said, I think I've taken too much of your time. If there are questions, we can go more in depth. But I agree with some of the speakers. There is an alternative. It may look bleak, but at such bleak times, there are opportunities for new to arise. So I think we should be able to see ahead of the clouds. They should not hinder our sight. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Javin. We're open to questions and comments now. Uh, when you sign up, uh, Svani will bring around a microphone. Stand up, uh, say what your name is and where you come from, and briefly uh, make it clear to who of the panels you are addressing. Make it either a question or a comment, but make it brief for the time constraints. Yeah. Federico. Hello. Hello. I'm Federico, uh, University of Leeds. Thank you for your presentation. I have a question and a suggestion for the last panelist and to all of us. Uh, the question is if you have uh, any links with the Zapatista movement in Chiapas. I think that is a very, there are very many links among the two experiences. And then, as you suggested, uh, in these day, this days, uh, come out many times the question what the university and academics can do to support the movement. So I think that is a great idea to go all together outside uh, the parliament and to the protest and show that all the people from this conference and all the university are supporting 
and important struggles. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, are there more questions or comments? Yes. And you can just sign up because I will notice uh, and I will keep track of you. So, Eleanor. Hi, Eleanor. Um, oh, ISC, University of Massachusetts. Um, my question is also um, directed at Javin. Um, um, what do you see as sort of the potential role of refugees from Syria um, in Istanbul, in cities around the Middle East? Are there any more comments or questions? We'll, we'll try and uh, we'll, we'll wrap it up. Uh, Janet? Uh, I wanted to ask Mark Lucarelli, I think you mentioned in passing that we need to massively transform the urban infrastructure. Could you elaborate on that, please? What did you mean by that? Questions or comments? Jeff, just take it. Uh, yes, final. Can I sign myself? <laughs> No, I, I just wanted to see, uh, because uh, uh, in, in terms of what is common here now in the panel and also in the discussion, uh, for example, to have in, in, in what sense does uh, uh, the, the Kurdish movement, I, I know there's been a more emphasis on environmental issues and ecology, and maybe you could say something about that and, and how it sees itself in relation to, for example, Indignados movement, Occupy movement, and how ecological questions are connected to these. I mean, w what you see in, as a common challenges, common opportunities uh, in terms of being uh, that, that, that you've been talking about and movements that is not only on environmental issues, but that try to combine social and, and, and ecological issues and, and, and also very strong emphasis on, on sort of grassroots democracy and non-hierarchy and, and these, uh, these issues. So, 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 so what, is, what is common here? What is, what is, uh, yeah, what is shared and what, what are sort of common opportunities and is this part of the same movement or is it different things? Thank you. Um, please just sign up. We have a half an hour, but uh, I will uh, let Havin answer now. Give the microphone, and then uh, there will be Mark after that. So, okay. Thank you for the questions, because as I said, I was not able to delve into anything really. Um, obviously, when you are trying to uh, propose an alternative to state, what you mean is that. Uh, you're trying to smash centers of power, actually, at the very beginning, you know. Um, so, so that's why this, this question is very important. And we're not trying to get that power and give it to the people, you know. Because I think the important issue is, is freedom. And the way we approach power, it, like it's, it's like the, you know, power to, or... or um, the, uh, what do you say, mm. power to the proletarian, like the, the real socialists used to say, right? Or the, a proletariat state to the proletariat. We saw that the old tools, when they are in the hands of even the most, you know, revolutionaries, you can only um, repeat the old stuff. So you can't really produce new stuff with the old stuff, you know. This is why. Um, we have many things common um, because we also believe that environmental issues cannot be taken into hand through uh, some palliative um, solutions, you know, to drop the level of this and to do this, to do that. It is inherent to patriarchal capitalism. It is ontologic to it. So therefore, if you want to um, get rid of exploitation, if you want to, you know, um, elevate the suppression of women, children, society, whatever, um, what you need to do is get rid of uh, the system with all, all its tools, 
you know. So, so therefore, um, the, the common opportunities here is that um, it may be difficult a little bit more or it, the, the, the methodology or the way ahead forward may be a little bit more difficult in Europe. But there is an opportunity at the moment which is very vibrant and there in the Middle East, you know, because all the borders of World War I is becoming more meaningless. All the regimes are shattering. Capitalism itself is in a systemic crisis and it's trying to reshape the Middle East in order to be able to perhaps prolong its lifetime for another hundred years. So the opportunity is there actually to be able to create something new. But there are problems because there are important pillars of this democratic modernity that I tried to spell out and Practically, there are many problems in trying to make this happen. For example, what's alternative economy? How are we going to do this? For example, you know, like in, in the North Kurdistan, in Turkey, we had several um, structures parallel to one another. On the one hand, we had a political party that went into parliament and now that political party has become more Turkey-wide. So we are trying to, in fact, bring together Kurdish and people from Turkey in this party to struggle for progressive ends. On the other hand, there is the municipalities, which are also pro problematic because a while ago, you know, it wasn't democratic confederalism, but it was still unclear and it was still coming from a marxist ledinist tradition. So we are trying to transform these municipalities at the same time. On the other hand, we are having assemblies um, from a very you know, village level to a big city level where the municipality is also included in it. And we're trying to make sure that that assembly uh, gets to decide on the whole city. So there are all these things that are happening. And of course, there was a big blow by the Turkish state, and they arrested tens of thousands of activists, legal activists, who were trying to implement all what I'm talking about. And because of these arrest waves, more than tens of thousands had to get out of the country. So this project was left crippled, and there's now fresh attempts to yet again uh, work on this. So. I don't know, you know, as I said, there is a, the restriction of time, but I have brought some brochures with me, and I think they're also outside on some of the issues that, that we've been talking about. So these, these are the important issues uh, for us as well. I mean, it may be a little bit different to what you're doing and discussing, because we have the imminent danger still um, against the Kurdish people, against their actual existence, but even at war times, we are seeing that these are the times that we need to implement these, you know, because this is what will make the change come through. You know, we can't just say, let's hang on, we'll do it later. So we are well aware of these as well. Um, I invite you all to actually come and examine uh, and also to understand better both the theory and the practice. And perhaps we can strengthen each other's practices as well. This is also much needed. There is no rosy picture down there uh, because people also have their, um, you know, they are used to doing things in some ways. And uh, so we need to uh, give another image of life, vision of life, you know, not the American, the capitalist American way of life, you know, because I mean, I think Erdogan says something really nice. He says the best achievement of capitalism is that, you know, maybe 200 years ago when people were hungry, they would rebel. But now, when they're hungry, they dream of winning the lotto. Mm -hmm. Now, this is something very important, what you strive for. And so I think this is where capitalism has won because people cannot imagine a life beyond state. They think there will be chaos. They think it, it won't be livable. We are having difficulty with Kurdish people as well.
because they also have learned to uh, equate nation with state. You know, so we are explaining to everybody that we are not demanding something less. On the contrary, we are demanding something more than you know uh, what's there. And um, yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, there was other questions, but uh... <laughs> now it's uh, Mark. If you can answer the question from uh, Janet, and then there's Bjorn. Please sign up. Uh, there are room for more, so. so. Uh, can I comment also on the last talk, uh, points? Because I, I think you have to you have to decide when you're working out a, a social theory um, how it is you can accumulate power. I mean, I, I just have to say I, I I don't believe in trying to smash power because. If you try to do that, you, that means you have to take up arms and start shooting people. I don't, I don't you know, I'm not interested in that as a, I would rather uh, accumulate power to the side and then uh, enter into um, democratic processes to alter um, the system. So, but that's just, you know, my way of seeing things. I think another important point that's come up um, also the last speaker and also earlier is what you make of changes in the past. Um, I, I don't think, I know that conservation in the 19th century didn't solve our environmental problems today, couldn't have, because they couldn't have imagined them. But conservation wasn't a wasted effort. It stopped deforestation. It provided water supplies for cities that are in place right now. Um, it, it did things that are useful and that we're using today to, to maintain our way of life. And so I, the same with, uh, with, with geopolitics. Uh, the, the war was, uh, World War II was a, a change from an old European system of empires that were at each other's throats and entered into two war murderous world wars uh, into, a, into a system of international capitalism that has now reached the point of creating a crisis. But it was better than what preceded it. We don't, I don't see, that's how I see the sort of way in which problems arise. We find solutions and other problems will occur. This isn't, we're not going to solve all the problems of humankind, we're human beings, they, they're problems, and there will always be, in my view. But that's just something you have to sort of deci decide, whether you want a practical utopianism or an absolute utopianism that somehow will solve problem, all problems for all time. That's just, in regard to your specific question about cities, is a similar answer I would give. I mean, in some places, Oslo is not really an interesting place to, to do urban planning, I think, because it's too rich. And, and there's too many people moving in here. And um, I mean, what should be done is that there's got to be something done. And someone mentioned this about the housing market here, so that people don't have to live so far away from where they work. That's the first and most important principle of urban planning is proximity. And if you can control the market, build housing cooperatives and so forth, of course, the obvious thing that needs to be done is to shift trans uh, transportation systems. That doesn't, isn't necessarily an end all, but that's an easy step that a lot of people will uh, agree to. But I mean, the main thing is cities that are, have been abandoned. There's no capital there. I mean, everybody's saying capitalism is bad, but you need capital to start economies. The problem is that capital is circulating in smaller and smaller circuits. It's not getting down to Detroit. It's not getting down to so many cities, especially in North America. I mean, the Europeans don't know how bad it is, really. Maybe beginning to know now. So how do you do that? I mean, who has the power to redistribute capital? Is that going to be something that we can do at the community level? Can we do that? Uh, can, can, we, can we do that by organizing the civil society, or, is, or are those steps toward a larger goal? Thank you. Yes. Irene, can I say something? Because he has responded to me, and I think he's understood me well. Okay, very briefly, very briefly, and then it's Bjorn after that. Just very briefly, I don't want to go on for a long time. Now, when I say 
smash centers of power or centers of power concentration. I do not mean go and take the tank and go to the government building and smash that down. No, I was talking more about when we are building our own um, tools of decision making, we should do it in such a way that power is not concentrated in one place, that it is more um, you know, spread. This is what I was talking about, to cut it short. Thank you. Björn, and then it's uh, Brian, Jonathan, and Marlene uh, after that. Uh, yeah. oh, wait, wait for the microphone, oh. yes. Thank you. Uh, yeah, my name is Björn. I'm a PhD fellow here at uh, Oslo University, and I'm also an activist uh, with background in uh, environmental movement. And um, I have a uh, and yeah, thank you for uh, it's a very uh, inspiring panel down there. Uh, I have a question to uh, to Dan uh, Shadokov, uh, and that is uh, you say uh, that uh, in your town in Vermont. Uh, that you already um, uh, work within a direct democratic uh, system there, and that sounds uh, sounds very very nice. Uh, what I'm wondering is uh, if you implement direct democracy at a, a town level, uh, that somehow is probably uh, generates a lot of conflict uh, since you do it inside a rather hierarchical state. Um, and I uh, was uh, wondering first, like, uh, how do you kind of Solve this uh, these contradictions that uh, that obviously ap appear, and the, the second and maybe more important question is uh, how is it possible to go at, go further from there? Uh, is like these town meetings that you have is this a way of how we can uh, go further to a like a real democratic um, uh, state too? Um, thank you, uh, Brian. Thank you. Um, first, an another question for Haven. Of course, many of us have, have known about the PKK's interest in these ideas for a number of years, but have really just over the last few months begun to learn about some of the, the substance of, of what's really going on there. Uh, I think that's one of the reasons many of us are, are really focusing. Uh, on, on these questions. Um, I'd be curious to hear more about how the PKK in moving this agenda forward relates to those elements in the Kurdish communities that have not yet uh, come to accept the revolutionary agenda that you're putting forward. What kinds of, of educational and organizing processes are used to, to broaden the support for, uh, for this alternative model. And then uh, I'd also like to encourage Dan to maybe follow up a little bit on Mark's last point and tell us a little bit about the different forms of utopianism and how they uh, help us move uh, our work forward. Thank you. Then it's Jonathan and Malin, and uh, until uh, 4.30, you're still able to sign up, Dimitri, yes? Uh, it's Jonathan and then Malin. Okay, I have a, a question maybe to several of you, but uh, it was Mark who mentioned uh, uh, just in the passing something about um, uh, Mumford and Jane Jack Jacobs and the Regions and so. Uh, you could sort that out, please, because I, I, I became interested. And then I wonder, how, the, the, the more general question is, is, is like this. What, what are the appropriate strategies to re revitalize Regions? I understand that is a very important part of the puzzle. And uh, you just, you just talk, Mark also talked about some of the problems, some of the difficulties that when you, when you focus on revitalizing cities or co uh, municipalities or communities, uh, it can be that they, they, the capital has gone away from them. And of course you can do some things with very little capital, but 
you need capital to develop uh, those uh, communities. So, and that is a question I also get curious about the, the struggle in Kurdistan. How do you do that uh, practically, economically? Because that must be part of your struggle too. So, yes. Thank you. And uh, this is going now. Yes, it's, it's going to Malin. I just want to add a, a short comment there uh, because I think that's, uh, I would like to ask Johanna too uh, about the, the solidarity work. And um, I'm wondering, these large scale uh, environmental campaigns, to what extent are they able to, to dig into the communities of, of Iraq and in the Middle East? What's your experience? Because it comes from a from the different angle than Havins. So I'm just curious to, to follow up on that. Then it's Malin and then Dimitri and Camilla. Okay. Um, yeah, this is more um, comment and question to all of us and to the organizer since this is the roundup's last session. I think it's uh, just listening to this and like oh, being part of all the whole conference is really I'm so overwhelmed. There's really, really, really good presentations and really good discussions and coming together like this. I just want to raise the question of like how, I'm sure maybe you will go into it later, but how will it continue? Like, where, like you have made this first conference and I'm feeling like, wow, I don't want to, you know, go from here and what's going to happen next and where do you disappear all of these great people I met? You know, I want to have the forum of meeting again. And I know you're gonna do another, you're gonna put together all the papers into a book and, but is there any plans of make, making another conference or forum connected to this continuing? Because I wanna, that's what I want, <laughs> basically. So if you, people in here or organizer have an answer to that, I'm happy to hear. Or people come up with something to continue on as well. I would like to connect more with people. I know you're going to send out uh, people being here in the conference. I hope we will. Many ways of connecting. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, Dimitri and then Camilla after that. Dimitri Rosopoulos. I'm suffering from indigestion. <clears throat> I find it hard to understand the rationale of this particular panel because it goes into four quite distinct directions. And to try to understand the relationship between that, uh, I'm not going to come to this university to get a PhD to try to understand it. But let me focus my attention to that young man there who's chewing gum. He asked, <laughs> he asked, where can we get capital to do community development or any other kind of development? I'll tell you where we can get it. The cooperative movement. The cooperative movement is a vast movement all over the world. There are all sorts of cooperatives, farming cooperatives, housing cooperatives, fishing cooperatives, industrial cooperatives. The international cooperative movement, my friends, has assets of $17 trillion. $17 trillion, and it is as democratic as uh, the trade union movement, because it's based upon the seven principles of Rochdale, founded in 1844. I won't go into the principles. The international cooperative movement, as a matter of fact, creates more employment throughout the world than the 400 biggest dominating multinational corporations. If ecologists are not members of cooperatives, they need to see the nearest psychiatrist as soon as possible. Thank you. Then it's Camilla. And uh, any final people who want to sign up, please do. <laughs> we will start. Uh, after that, we will also have uh, the, the answers will be given by uh, some final reflections by the uh, panelists. So, yes, Camilla. Uh, yeah, I have a, a question for uh, Harvin Gunnarsson. And uh, I, I find it very inspiring, the way you are creating direct democracy. And uh, 
I wonder if you have advice uh, to uh, people here in uh, Norway, how we can uh, uh, start to uh, organize and uh, build uh, direct democracy assemblies. How can we spread the ideas, uh, make them popular in the social movements, and how can we start on the ground to build institutions? Uh, yeah, thank you. Anyone else signing up? Yes, Ercilia. Um, and yeah. Thanks. Yeah, thank you for the really interesting talks. I just want to ask a question to, um, sorry for the names, to the Middle East activists, just to make sure, if you can expand a bit, because you mentioned about the role of women in that content, in the, as an activist in the Middle East, as in the Kurdistan, but also in uh, your movement. Anyone for a comment or questions before? Very good. Um, I think we can start. Uh, no, we, we, we can, if you want to ask, uh, no, answer directly, uh, I think you can do that. I think we should give you a little more time for the final reflections. And uh, I think we, we do it in the reverse order. So. Javin, you will be first, and then it's Mark, Johanna, and then Dan. Um, I thank you all for very uh, insightful questions. Uh, most of these questions are, of course, issues that uh, we are also still dealing with, especially economy. I have to say that the Kurdish freedom movement has been dealing the least with economy. And this is a huge problem, of course. But you, from what I have explained, how the Kurdish freedom movement came about, what the priorities were, and the more the denial policy over the Kurdish identity is shattered, the more, of course, other issues are having more of a uh, currency for the Kurdish people. And the three pillars were, were described, and one of them was definitely um, economy based on user value. So it's very at a very primitive um, and principles stage. Uh, this is one area that needs solidarity and support because we have, especially in the Syrian Kurdistan, a large areas uh, that are polit politically organized. But in terms of economy and in terms of education, in terms of health, in terms of all these other things, there are ideas, but there are now efforts to implement them. So this is what I can say. It's still a matter of discussion and efforts to, to try and implement. So for economy, it's, it's a real challenge for us. And we know that if we are unsuc unsuccessful at this point, it's going to determine a lot of, whole lot of things. So it's very important to, to set out um, something and but what we are doing is grounding such decisions to assemblies to local councils to women's assemblies to youth assemblies so everybody should have a say in this so the general idea is still also current for economic decisions as well so these assemblies are not there only to decide you know what they will harvest or what they will you know, do with the train lines or this and that, but also decide, you know, what economic um, steps or, or, you know, how the nature is, is approached to or, or things like that. So, um, now, for Norway, I really can't say much, I am afraid. But the only thing I can say is that do not be, you know, um, I don't want to use the word fooled, but don't be fooled <laughs> with what you see at the moment, because we know that there were several different strategies implemented around the world. The Middle East had for its share the Green Belt, the radical Islam fundamentalist 
reactionary Islam pumped up by capitalism, by imperialism. And for Scandinavia, it was more of welfare states to stop the spread of communism from Soviet Union. I mean, we know all this. So you may have structures still there which are good, you know. I'm not saying, I mean, you know, we have the strategy, for example, even in Turkey, to democratize the republic, you know, use that channel at the same time, but also make our own structures too, you know. So it's a, it's a dual thing. So, I mean, but you will know best, just as, you know, dynamically in Kurdistan, we would know perhaps the best what, what would suit us. Um, so I can say that. And um, what's after this con conference? Um, we have something on. Maybe I can share that with you all. We had the first conference in 2012 in Hamburg. We're also planning another one um, next year in, in spring. We don't have the dates clear as yet, but we're now in the process of discussing uh, how we want to do this conference. Last year it was m more critique and a little, little bit more on the solution. This year we want to have it purely on the solution. And we have now more experience than the last time practical experience, we want to put them on the table, and we would like to, again, like in 2012, have different movements come in and share their own experience, and maybe we can learn lessons from each other's practices. For women's activism, um, it's really interesting. Uh, the, the PKK uh, began this, this women's revolution within the PKK, first of all. They, they formed a separate women's organization. Now, of course, let me also warn you that by forming a separate women's organization doesn't mean you remove all forms of exploitation. But it is a leverage point against or, you know, to balance that male dominance that automatically um, come together and they do the, the you know, the same thing together. So it's, it's, they don't even have to talk about it. And, you know, people don't become revolutionary overnight. They don't implement democratic confederalism overnight. It's a continuous process of learning and also um, struggling towards one another as well and towards yourself too. And this is why it's important to be able to have a different vision of life we have to fight with that as well, because we've, give, we've been given a vision of life. And um, as I said, you know, when I, I was in South Africa, I don't know, about a month ago, and I talked about these, and people said, no, we can't live without a state. I mean, I, I'm sure they were intentionally good, you know, but to, to go over this. So for, for women, as I said, within the movement, um, there's a separate women's movement and in the society too. Um, for example, when ISIS attacked Ezidi Kurds, nobody protected them. There was a genocide. And by the time PKK guerrillas reached there, the genocide was done. They were able to stop ethnic cleansing. But you can't, especially in the situation that the Middle East is in, you know, you can't reach everywhere. So what's being done is there are also women's self-defense forces. There were Triple tragedy, tragedies lived. Women attempted suicide. They took their own lives so as not to fall into the hands of ISIS. Their fathers killed them so that they wouldn't fall into the hands of ISIS. You know, and so it's and, and when they fell into the hands of ISIS, they were killed anyway or sold or whatever. So, as I said, we are different, living different realities, but at the very heart, they are the same. You know, maybe what we're going through in Middle East is more extreme, but ontologically, they stem from the same thing. Um, yeah, thank you. Thank you. Uh, Someone was interested in uh, Jane Jacobs and Mumford, but I don't want to say too much because I'm writing an article on that question right now, but basically, uh, it has something to do with uh, some, uh, an, uh, an issue about cities and, and, um, and, its and the city's relation to the surroundings that came up in the discussion. 
and it goes back to the, to mid, the Middle Ages um, and to the Renaissance, the Italian Renaissance, with the idea that architecture should define the city. And the architecture and the street and the plaza and so forth should define the city. And, and the 19th century idea, although it started earlier, that landscape uh, is really the defining question. And that really comes down, uh, we usually try to find a way of bringing those two, uh, people are interested in these issues on the left, trying to bring these two into some sort of coordination, but it's, there is actually a, a theoretical uh, and problematic questions there. Um, around, for example, how do you show or how do you demonstrate experientially that a city, once you're inside it, is actually related to its surroundings? This came up in a panel. How, how could you do that? You know, where, where does that happen? Um, and, and among other issues. But effectively, also after the war, um, America regional, Mumford was a regionalist. Um, but, I mean, he wanted this to be directed by the state. That's the part that's forgotten. You know, during the 1930s, the federal government bought and took millions of hectares of land out of private hands. They just nationalized it. And um, this, the idea was around the cities, why couldn't something like this be done so that it would control development and you could build regional cities as kind of satellites to um, to the, the larger cities. That was Mumford's vision. Um, what happened after the war is basically com almost completely unrelated to it, but Jane Jacobs said that it was Mumford's vision, so that's what I was referring to there. Strategies for the development of regions. Well, we don't have developmental economics anymore because we've, we've allowed the, the academy to define economics uh, as a global exchange. So therefore, we're not interested in the development of uh, regional or national uh, economies in Africa or anywhere else, um, because all money is in the control of a few financial interests, a few banks, um, who, uh, national banks and private banks. By the way, excuse me for chewing gum, but I, I, something happened in my throat, and I, was, I got into a coughing fit, and so this is like, I'm, I'm sort of like my blanket. I'm hanging on to this gum so that I don't st start, start coughing uh, again. Uh, I love cooperatives, and, and frankly, uh, Dimitri, I, I just love your vision. I think it's fantastic. I mean, anybody who's, you know, I have Italian deep in my background. You know, everything's about cities and sta little city states. It's all about decentralization, not about nations, you know. I learned that and, and so forth. And I think oh, I really wish the world could be like that, but we don't have a lot of time here. I think we need the existing structures. We need to take them and return them around because I don't think we have an enormous amount of time to deal with the uh, crises, spe specifically climate change and so forth that we're facing. So. That, anyway, um, yeah, I, and another way of putting it is, I, I, I really hope that cooperatives become a major part of, of, uh, of, nat of, of, globe, of the global economy, because that would, would really help a lot. But I just, right, looking at it right now, to me, that, that's just not enough. But I don't know. Joanna? Yeah, so you, you ask about the digging into the communities and, and what the activism look at the community level. So it's uh, very different uh, in North Iraq than in South Iraq. In, in the South, you have the marsh, the marshlands, and they've been in, in a process of restoration, so the local communities came after the 2003, when the marshes uh, you know, were 90% uh, of them were drained. Uh, the marsh Arabs you know, were uh, refugees in Iran, in other parts of Iraq. They came back. They, uh, broke the embankments that were containing the water, so the marshes came back, the people came back, the fishing came back, uh, the ecosystems uh, came back. Uh, in the north, is a, and they are uh, fighting with the government because now we, with all these uh, dam developments, in, not only in Turkey, but also in Iran, that is rerouting the rivers and, and damming the rivers. Uh, it's a big issue of uh, 
the ecosystem in the marshes and also salinity because they you have less water coming down so this this the water from the Persian Gulf is coming in so there's a big issue of salinity in the south of Iraq in the north of Iraq you have communities like in Suleimania closer to Iran that are again protesting uh, dam uh, developments in Iran uh, more generally in the Kurdistan uh, region there's still they're still for building uh, dams to contain the water because they are uh, afraid of, of the dam developments in Turkey. So it's a big struggle at the local level, then at the national level uh, within Iraq, and then at the international level fighting with uh, Iraq and, and Iran. So yeah, that you want us to go on, on to the concluding remarks yes, also? Yes. Yeah. So I also want to uh, add the issue of priority. I mean, there is a big uh, political crisis in the country, and water doesn't seem to be a big priority. And then you have the Kurdistan region uh, and the central government. There is a big fight. Uh, the Kurdistan region will be, um, do you say, an, an upstream a region, an upstream a actor. And there will be a internal fight for water between the north uh, region and the, the south in Baghdad and, and the rest of the, the country. And, and, and also, uh, I want to stress again the issue of uh, solidarity, because it helps to focus activists in, inside Iraq on, on that the water issue is important, that they have a security and a political crisis, but that still they need to deal with the water issue because when the political crisis is over, they, you know, they, they cannot drink oil. They have to uh, protect their water resources. They have a lot of oil, and there might be some people talk about exchanging oil for water uh, in, in Turkey, but we believe as you know, activists and environmental uh, concern about the environment that we have the right to water and that there will, should be equitable shares of the Tigris and, and Euphrates River, so they should talk together to, to have economic cooperation or whatever agreement it is. We, we don't know what, what it would look like, but they need to, to manage the river wisely and you know, sustainably. So, and in the, in the part of the women's movement, I had uh, the opportunity to work with, uh, also with uh, Kurdish activists. And in, in the North is really better than in the rest of Iraq. At least they have laws in paper what the uh, women's movement is trying to implement the existing laws, for example, against killing of women, honor killing is a big issue. Early marriages, forced marriages is a big issue now. We saw it with the with the Yazidi community. You know, there's a lot of forced marriages, early marriages to try to protect women. So uh, in the north, again, it's more uh, developed the movement than in the south. There's no shelters, for example, in the south. In the north, there are shelters. So it's, it's a big issue. The woman issue is also a big issue in all of Iraq and Kurdistan. Mm. Thank you. Okay. Yeah, I also really want to thank the conference organizers for putting all of this together. It's been an incredible weekend. And particularly want to thank Eric for inviting me to come. And very happy to be here. Uh, I want to address the question about town meeting first. Yes, there are conflicts between our town meetings and the state, but I don't want to give people the wrong impression. Town meeting, it, this is not an insurgent institution that the revolutionaries in Marshfield, Vermont, instituted in the recent past. This is a long-standing tradition in Vermont, and this is, in fact, the official form of governance for almost all of our towns and cities in the state. The town meeting uh, had its origins in the American Revolution and initially was throughout all of the New England states. It now exists primarily in Vermont in its uh, purer form, but it's not the pure form. Initially, the town meeting had very wide purview and did, in fact, have a great deal of uh, legitimate authority in determining larger issues, statewide issues. And what we've seen is that increasingly the purview of town meeting has been decreased so that today we make decisions that directly affect our town. We set our tax rate. We decide how we're going to spend our money. We make decisions about our roads and our water system, uh, our school system, zoning, planning, other regulations for the town. And we do sometimes see conflicts with the state. 
The thing that we've tried to do, though, is to expand the purview of town meeting. And we've done that through uh, a process where we take on resolutions that are clearly outside of our legal authority, uh, issues that affect the whole state and, in fact, affect the whole nation. But we've been pretty successful in doing that in the sense that this is something that Brian worked on a lot and others in the Institute have worked on a lot. We've, insti we've introduced resolutions at town meetings regarding genetically modified organisms. Is it 85 towns in Vermont passed that resolution. We've passed resolutions calling for the closure of our single existing nuclear power station in Vermont, and we succeeded in getting that closed as of this December. Next December, it will be closed down. We'll com be completely in the process of decommissioning. Uh, we've introduced resolutions regarding uh, oil t tar sands pipeline that they're trying to run through Vermont. Uh, we've had some success with that as well. And numerous other resolutions, even on the national level. In 2000, uh, Vermont town meetings passed resolutions calling for a nuclear freeze, which actually led to the revitalization of an anti-nuclear movement nationwide that resulted in a march of almost a million people in New York City and uh, ultimately led to certainly not uh, disarmament, but a reduction in the nuclear arsenal of the United States. So we're able to we have a moral authority even where we don't have a legal authority. And we would like very much, of course, the vision. You ask, how do we expand this? Uh, the vision is to actually empower town meetings and then confederate them, first at the regional level, where we do have a lot of regional cooperation between towns in Vermont, even today, ultimately at the state level, and then the continental level. And that's very much the vision of social ecology, the vision of uh, communalism. And this is the way that we hope to replace and challenge the power of the nation state. And as an aside, I have to say something about this issue of power. Because as an anthropologist, I can tell you that all human societies have power, that there is a power dynamic at play. We can't eliminate power. But what we can do is restructure power. Power is structured hierarchically today. A hierarchy is a system of command and control that ultimately has recourse to physical coercion to enforce its will. Uh, we can change that. We can take power over and change it into power with. And that's the goal of libertarian municipalism, to empower individual citizens to participate actively in making decisions that affect their lives. So I think that that is, in fact, suggests a strategy and that that strategy will rest on both contesting for power with centralized forms of power and at the same time creating prefigurative and counter institutions that allow us to expand the purview of power in our own lives in the face of and in opposition to this centralized form of power. Um, I hope that addresses the question about town meeting. I don't want to be too long because I know our time is up here. And I don't want to be too repetitive because I, I saw a number of you at a presentation that I did earlier today. But I do want to address Brian's question about utopia. And there I would say that um, the word utopia has historically had two meanings. One is sort of cloud cuckoo land, and that's primarily the way the word is understood today. It's used as a dismissive uh, oh, that's utopian, that's impossible, that could never happen. That's not the kind of utopia that I'm talking about. We're not talking about creating communities with lakes of lemonade and climbing big rock candy mountains. Uh, we're bounded by the physical world. We're bounded by real existing potentialities. And the second meaning of utopia is that utopia is the good place or the better place. And that is the utopia that social ecology envisions. I think utopia plays a crucial role in our struggles because without a vision of where we want to go, we'll never know if we're taking steps that move us towards the goals we want to achieve or take us away from it. So it serves as a point of orientation, very importantly. It serves as a point of inspiration. Uh, and there is no unified utopia here. I'm not talking about a blueprint or a mechanistic plan. I'm talking about an orientation towards a set of principles that can guide us in our struggle. 
that can allow us to determine whether the little incremental steps that we're taking today are actually moving us towards a better world or are in fact reinforcing the existing world. Uh, and I think it's vitally important that we have that vision. And that vision has to be articulated by each community. The, the utopian vision in Kurdistan is going to be very different from the utopian vision in Vermont, though I think we do share a set of common principles. And ultimately, is, it is those principles and the ethics and the politics that we derive from those principles that would determine the course of our struggles. So that's all I'll say about that. Thank you very much to the panels. Thank you, Dan, Mark, Johanna, and Havin. I think, uh, contrary to Dimitri, I think that all of these uh, speakers actually pointed to problems that are connected. I'm very happy about how this, this panel turned out in pointing towards new movements and new possibilities. And I would like also to use the occasion to thank uh, Dimitri and Carla and Brian for, for giving their talks uh, and for all the speakers who were in the panels. I would like to thank the workshops, uh, Björn and the others, uh, Anna and, uh, and Malin, and uh, of course all the paper presenters. We've put in a lot of, a lot of papers within a short span of time, uh, but we've managed to keep the schedule. And, uh, and uh, I think that you have all contributed so in, in, a, in a very enriching way. So thank you, everyone of the paper presenters. We will uh, give you information more about how to, to, to submit the final versions of your articles and so on, because we want to turn this into a book. We want or one or more publications. So stay tuned. And we also would like to, to, to say that uh, we have several books. This is a book that came out last year about the situation in uh, North Kurdistan and some of the utopian uh, thinking and practice there. Uh, we published it last year. Please check it out. Uh, we also have Dan's book here, more on utopias in the inner cities and, and in the rural sites. And check it out because now we're, we're leaving the book table. We have a Good prices. We want to, to, to bring those ideas back to your communities. And I think that there have been many good discussions. I think that there is a red thread here. I do see that we, we are striving towards some common goal. Uh, we've uh, taken a lot of different approaches to, to these questions. And I am. Um, I really want to say that I appreciate all of your contributions. But we also would not have been able to do this conference without the support of the Institute for Sociology and Human Geography. So thank you, Diveke, and thank you uh, to David Jurus Lier. And uh, I would say that we have also had several volunteers who have helped out during these last few days. Uh, on a lot of practical matters. And particularly, I don't know if Ingeborg is here, but she's done a wonderful job in uh, coordinating <laughs> the administrative work. She's over there. I yeah. <laughs> Excellent. Well, and we also have benefited from uh, a grant from Fritur uh, and the Norwegian Research Council. Uh, uh, but I'm very happy that we were able to have so many insightful uh, contributions by you. I think that you've all contributed to our uh, common program by bringing your ideas into the program. I hope and believe that you are able to bring the ideas of the program back into where you are active, into your communities, and I think that that is the most important task. There is, a, uh, there is an event tonight. I hope that mo all of you will join us. It will be at 8 o'clock down near Youngstorge in the center of town. We will have a concert with Onesorg and a DJ. Before uh, uh, the con uh, concert at 8 o'clock, it has been suggested that we will meet because there are ongoing demonstrations against the uh, Islamic State uh, outside of Parliament. Uh, we will be going there 
uh, 7.30 uh, to um, show our support and interact with them. For those of you who want to join, you're most welcome. And we will also end the program now, but, uh, but uh, there, we will meet for an informal lunch at uh, one o'clock for those who have not uh, left the country yet around Jongstorge, where we're meeting tonight. So we'll meet around the fountain around one o'clock and we can have a, a lunch and coffee and so on for those who are interested. And we will keep in touch with you. We, will, we have prepared uh, an evaluation scheme because this is the first time we've done this through the university. Uh, we've done a lot of events before, but mostly within the social movement and the ecology movement. And so, uh, but I think it's, it's been very inspiring and uh, promising. And uh, we hope that most of you, both uh, participants and presenters, will be able to give us the feedback. Uh, and then we will see if we can do this again. And as the coordinator of the program, I am uh, in that privileged position of giving up a final comment, and I do believe that there are possibilities. I do believe that there is hope, but I just want to answer um, Mark uh, because uh, I think that it's, it's, uh, it's not necessary for us to be wildly optimistic. And I would like to end with a quote uh, of the Norwegian poet, Jan-Erik Wall, who says, there is no hope and we refuse to give up. <laughs> Thank you very much, everybody.